Uh, we have David Simmons, who's uh, Managing Director uh, and Head of Strategic Capital from Willis Ree. And uh, so he's going to be addressing us from, from uh, without slides, which is a, a challenge I must admit I can never rise to. So <laughs> over to you, David. Yes, yeah, please use the microphone. Uh, yeah. Firstly, I apologise for the lack of slides, but I, I, I do slides all the time. It's quite nice to have the challenge not to do it, actually. Um, firstly, I should say a little bit about reinsurance. What is reinsurance? Um, I, like most people working in the insurance industry, fell into it by mistake, and very few people choose insurance as a career, or used to. Um, you, you very quickly find out it's social death. Uh, people think insurance is deathly, deathly dull and very boring. So those poor souls of us sitting in insurance try to find the interesting sexy bits. And the sexy bits of insurance is reinsurance. Reinsurance is like a bookie laying off their bets. Uh, they can take so many bets on the favourite, but if the number of bets on the favourite exceeds a certain amount, they have to place a bet with somebody else. And this really happens mostly for catastrophe risk, mostly for things like windstorms, earthquakes, floods, tsunamis. So a, a, a company like uh, Aviva can afford to lose four or five houses burning down in London, but if there is a massive flood, then they may lose... 20,000 properties, and that they can't afford. And then they, they buy, they insure themselves. So that's really how the, how the reinsurance market works. And we do actually have a problem in the reinsurance market at the moment, a big problem. We've got too much money. Now, you might, this may seem a strange problem for you, um, but well, there's too much capital wanting to enter the reinsurance market. Traditionally, the reinsurance market's been dominated by big um, spe specialist companies, Munich Re, Swiss Re, and various syndicates in Lloyd's in London, who actually write right, right this type of business. But now we're getting interest from pension funds, for example. Why pension funds? Because they are finding it very difficult to invest their money and get any return. There's no return on cash. There's zero, often zero return on, on government bonds. Right? Equities are deemed to be too risky. So what can they invest in? And what the people are investing in is catastrophe risk. This may seem a little bit odd, but the idea is actually if you actually write a bond, somebody issues a bond, which pays you perhaps 5% interest, which is very good in this market, but if there's an earthquake in Tokyo, you lose your money. Right? And that's the gamble they pay. So there's a 1 in 100 chance of an earthquake in Tokyo, they lose their money, but if they don't, 99% of the time, they get a 5% return. Right? So that, that kind of market has entered our game, and that's been life-changing for us. This, this has happened in the last three, four years. And this has a, quite a few implications for the topic of this conversation. Why has this happened? Well, for better or for worse, the capital markets feel that we understand catastrophe risk now. This wasn't true going back 30 years, or even 20 years. 20 years ago, um, we were actually back in the late 80s, early 90s, the reinsurance market was caught out. So, for instance, in the UK, some of you may remember there's a big storm in 87 in the UK, a one in a hundred year event. Three years later, there was a bigger storm. So, hang on a second, that's a 100 year event. We've now got another one bigger three years later. We've had nothing like that, by the way, since then, which is quite interesting. But people say, oh, perhaps we don't understand this risk properly. In 1992, there's a massive hurricane, Hurricane Andrew, which hit just north of Miami biggest hurricane losses on record. People think we need to understand this risk better. And actually, the, the idea of modelling risk, trying to understand um, a model, hurricanes particularly, had developed in the early 1980s by a guy called Friedman, and he published a paper. And effectively, his, his paper has been actually how we now model catastrophes all around the world. We try to understand the hazard, try to understand what the probability of an earthquake is, what the probability of an earthquake, where it's going to occur, how big it can be, if it occurs, what kind of damage you can do to the property on the ground, and therefore what's the loss. And there's been a massive, massive, massive investment in this type of modelling. We have actually specialist companies set up. All they do is do this type of modelling. The biggest is one called RMS, who's actually, strangely enough, owned by the Daily Mail. Very weird. Um, but there's, that's a big, big cash earner for the Daily Mail Trust. And so so the, the, the capital markets feel we understand the risk. Now, I'll come back to whether we do or whether we don't. Certainly, the market's been through various stages, from absolute b belief in models, this is a saviour, we didn't know before, now we know everything, 
and you had the kind of the computer says yes or the computer says no type thing, which is, but now people get a little bit more sophisticated and understand the limitations of models and how they can be used. But what modeling has done is massively increase our understanding of the perils. To build this type of model, you need to deconstruct every different stage of the process. We understand the fiscal hazard far better than we understood it before. We understand where our buildings are, where the properties actually are located much better than we were before. We understand what they're built of. We understand how these buildings react to ground shaking or severe winds or to floods. Better, not perfectly, but better than we did before. And this clearly has big impacts for society as well, which I'll come back to in just a minute. So we do actually, so we do actually have uh, a lot of capital chasing, uh, chasing return, and we have modeling which has its limitations, but is pretty damn good, which is good for help us to understand risk. So all this capital chasing, chasing, um, chasing some return has done what you'd expect it to do. It's driven down price. Okay, so catastrophe reinsurance now is probably cheaper than it's ever been. All right, it's very, very cheap. And there's another point here. If you're an insurance reinsurance company and you are writing a, a risk in Florida, Florida Hurricane is the biggest concentration of risk in the world. So if you write one dollar of cover in Florida, you probably have to allocate 80 cents of capital to cover that risk. If you write one dollar of risk in sub-Saharan Africa, you probably have to allocate nothing, or perhaps two cents of capital. Because actually, if that, if that loss happens, it's not a capital event. You're not going to go bust because you haven't got enough exposure in Africa. You're going to go bust if there's a, a big loss in Florida. This kind of idea of risk diversification means the pricing of non-core territories is very cheap. And I'll come back to an example of that um, in, just, in, just a, in just a little min minute. In fact, I'll do it now. Um, we've, we were very fortunate in my company to win a tender for a program called the African Risk Capacity last year. The African Risk Capacity was actually created by the World Food Programme with the African Union. And actually, what it does is provide um, immediate drought aid to African countries. People now tend not to die in their thousands of drought. Actually, we are getting much better of getting aid to people to prevent the kind of mass events we saw in the 80s. But aid gets there too slowly. Very often after an event, governments promise aid, and it does arrive mostly, but not always. And when it does arrive, it arrives late. So effectively, you may, we may save people, but those people probably have to sell all their possessions, sell their seed stock, sell their animals. So they become totally dependent on state aid for the next three, four years. What the Africa Risk Capacity tries to do is get money there quickly. So as soon as an event has been recognized, the money is there to be used appropriately and actually prevents that type of thing. And they th the idea is they think that probably $1 invested quickly is worth $5 invested late. Okay, so it's, it's really quite important. Um, but it's more than just getting money and just getting financial return. It's also about risk management. And this is a really good example of how you can be smart with insurance. Okay. They, if, you want, if you're an African government and you want to join Africa Risk Capacity, you can't just apply and join. You actually have to go through a whole year's process. And that year is to actually to look at the risk in your country. What crops are there? Where are they grown? How much rain do they need? When do they need the rain? All right, so they actually go through a whole proving process of understanding what the risk actually is. Let's say, if there's a failure, what do you do? Do you buy more grain? Do you ship grain in? Do you need to move water to, to kind of feed animals? So what do you do? What, what type of response do you have? Can you provide that response? So the, so the government has to go through the approving program, write a kind of a draft uh, disaster response plan. They also have to pass, if you like, a um, certificate of good standing to make sure the money won't be spent on Mercedes when it arrives. Um, and also, it, once there is an event, they have to actually publish exactly what they're going to do with the money. And then, then they have to show by, to an audit later that they have spent it in the way they were going to spend it. So it's actually a very good way of making sure, number one, making sure there's proper risk awareness in the countries. And that, I think, is an example of what insurance can do. On a more parochial level, in the UK, for example, we have a new flood scheme called Flood Re, which is likely to, to be emerging soon, which effectively is the background to that 
is that the government, there used to be an agreement between insurers and the government that they would provide flood cover to everybody. The trouble was that was when they didn't understand what flood risk was. Now they have models and they know, hey, that guy is going to get flooded every 10 years. That guy who lives at the top of the hill will never get flooded. Why should he pay the same as him? Right? And actually, clever companies will say, well, actually, I'm, I'm going to target that guy. I'm going to avoid that guy. Right? So effectively, companies with historical books are left with all the rubbish. New companies entering the market avoid that guy and try and cut that guy out. So you get a, you get a distorted market in place. This is quite an interesting one. So our solution is to try and make sure there's some pooling of risk. The French way of doing it is to have solidarity. So if you want flood insurance in France, it's through a national scheme. And if you live right by the river or you live at the top of a mountain, you pay the same. Right? And that's just the way the French are. OK, but in the UK, we, we say, hey, why, why should I pay for that guy? He's chosen to live down there. It's his fault. Now, I'm not going to pay for him. Um, but in practice, we have some kind of fudge, if you like, which is quite good. Very typical British thing, kind of a fudge system. It's not one thing or the other. But if you have a scheme which evens everything out at the same premium, what's the incentive for that guy to improve his risk? Right, so actually having some risk-adjusted scheme of some kind make it better. So if you can actually build some decent barriers or actually make sure, guarantee you move your property or some, some other ways, or perhaps even negotiating with the government, say, OK, we will do this scheme, but only if you invest in flood protection for these guys on the river. You, you, you have some negotiating lever. So insurance can be a good way of actually forcing better resilience of societies and populations. Right? So better risk understanding and better, better ways of just managing process. But it's, there is problems. I mean, one big problem is premium, OK? Particularly if you're going to the Africa risk capacity, who pays the premium? Right? How can you expect, say, the government's going to say, one government scheme, for example, I don't know, Mauritania, to pay or an insurance premium? They've got no money anyway, all right? And in practice, they were paid by donors. But you have other schemes, like there's a very clever scheme made up for Manila, not Manila, uh, Jakarta, um, some years ago, a flood scheme, where people had the idea that you could sell a little card to somebody, and if they, 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 they buy this little card for $5, if there's a flood, they get $25 back, they just have to hand their card in. The trouble is, this, to people in, if you've got no money, are you going to pay $5 for effectively a low reward lottery? Right? It's not actually, it's not that, not that sensible. And strangely enough, it didn't work. So there has to be some way of making these things affordable. And actually, this is where donor money can come in, uh, actually where the Gates Foundation is very interested in this type of stuff, for example. But that is a, is a problem. But it is very, very sexy at the moment. Come back to the world again, for insurance anyway, at the moment. Um, there is a lot of interest in this. The World Bank are pushing these schemes big time. Right? They've been doing something in Vietnam. They're doing something in Africa. They were doing something in Bangladesh. There are the Chinese government are about to introduce such a scheme. The Philippines government are just about to introduce such a scheme. The schemes have been proven in Japan when they had the tsunami. They had a scheme. Then New Zealand, they had a scheme. Right? The New Zealand scheme got £10 billion pounds of reinsurance back, or $10 million, rather, of reinsurance back to actually show you how, how, how these things can actually work. ARC, the African Risk Capacity, is expanding from five countries to ten countries this year. Uh, there, there's a scheme in the Caribbean called the Caribbean, uh, called CREF, Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Fund, which is 16 countries, which is now extended into Central America. So these schemes actually can provide real societal benefit, but do need to be well designed, need, need to be well thought through, and you've got to think who's going to pay. Okay, that's where I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>
I just wanted to sort of uh, have a bit of a scientific uh, approach. Uh, let, let's get the terms right here. And uh, I would say there's even uh, the first bug in the term resilience. <laughs> um, just to read that out loud quickly, uh, resilience has two components. It's uh, the ability or the, uh, it is about capacities or Amartya Sen would have said, uh, probably uh, used the word entitlement of people or systems to cope, to adapt, to reduce risks, to mitigate risks, to prepare, others use bounce back or even to thrive. Or, and the last two uh, used uh, or taken from a definition by Oxfam uh, is to realize their rights and improve their well-beings. It's not more than that. Um, it's that easy. <laughs> Uh, and this is despite uh, or in, uh, in view of uh, multiple shocks, stresses, and uncertainties, which are multi-scalar and multi-temporal. So this is, uh, we heard about aspirations uh, to make it aspirational. I think this, if we previously talked about uh, sustainability, poverty reduction, uh, I think resilience is even an evolution of this aspiration. Uh, when you work for an aid agency or for uh, an implementing agency, you basically uh, have to ask yourself the question that it's the bot bottom left. Um, so what are we doing now <laughs> uh, in order to, uh, to realize that, in order to operationalize that? And it's the resil since we talk about multiple shock stresses and hazards, uh, uh, which hazard uh, is the more, most important and by, uh, by whom? By whom is fairly easy because uh, agencies, as Oxfam probably looks at the extreme poor and the poor, people that actually, uh, that uh, uh, their survival, their livelihoods are directly threatened by. Um, and then a short qu quote of a colleague of mine in the Philippines who said like, uh, there's uh, neither a cookie cutter nor a cookbook for resilience, which is a good thing. It's a very holistic uh, view on livelihoods. and. Uh, just to, uh, and this is why I have a little space, it's basically two, two things uh, if you want to build resilience. You want to tackle the first, which is about capacities, basically. You still have to find out which capacities uh, enable people to cope, adapt, reduce risks, and so on. Uh, and the second one is uh, to understand the hazard or the impact, and I think we, we did hear that before. Um, there's a big challenge, and I think science can do a big job in improving that uh, understanding. Uh, when it comes to the hazard and uh, this idea of uh, still responding and addressing the, the multi uh, multitude of hazards that people are basically subjected to in their lives, no one's only uh, subjected to one single risk or only an environmental hazard. Uh, and therefore, you need to understand the spatial uh, extent of uh, the damage zone and uh, what we just heard basically, and we talked about often risk assessments, getting an idea of intensity and duration. And before actually you do anything, you need to uh, uh, understand that because the dynamics and the, the choice of response and how, how you design a response and how you implement it is dependent on that. Um, and I've been, uh, obviously there's, there's a whole uh, range of, uh, of natural or environmental hazards and I've been, for my examples, I've been choosing slow onset uh, hazards uh, because I believe they're even more tricky, uh, because um, they uh, are a bit subtle, they're co called creeping disasters um, uh, as, as uh, compared to rapid onset, um, which have a different uh, response dynamic, which we can maybe also touch upon in the, in the uh, discussion. Uh, just to set the scene a bit, uh, obviously agencies like, uh, like Oxfam uh, works in 90 countries, uh, I've worked a lot for the United Nations, uh, they basically cover disasters and, uh, and hazards in, in more than 100 countries, uh, mo most of which are least developed countries or low or low middle income and so on. And we talk about floods, um, um, salt intrusion, and here we can see already one of um, one way, like how the environment as such has already a buffer capacity to uh, to these, um, and something that needs to be used. And uh, when it comes to building resilience and what is nowadays being done, I think it's the weakest part actually using the environment or the the ability of these ecosystem services that we talked before as uh, as 
uh, a buffer capacity as an important asset and the capacity to adapt. Um, and then when it comes to rapid onset, obviously they're, they're, we're, uh, we're switching much more uh, into a mode of uh, short-term help, uh, helping people to survive uh, immediately for the first weeks and months instead of uh, uh, looking at uh, structural causes of these hazards. Um, again, in order to um, understand, and I'll, I'll beg you, if you do work on resilience, please do me one favor. Uh, like us practitioners, uh, like I have in the, um, it's probably the first time I heard about resilience in my job was four or five years ago. I've seen two or 300 definitions of resilience. Uh, I guess a bit more scientific rigor w w would actually help. Um, but practitioners have to do something. They have to actually, uh, they can't wait until uh, like the, the full, full understanding is always done. So uh, there was also, uh, there's an applied research uh, kind of angle to it and trying to understand apart from the assets and the financial resources, which is pr probably this first uh, block, um, the livelihood viability in order to thrive and have economic um, resilience. What are other aspects that actually make resilience uh, or that build resilience so that we can do something about it? And um, Oxfam has come up with uh, five dimensions, which, uh, and you can look that up uh, if you want. Uh, there's, uh, there's certain effectiveness reviews of, of resilience building programs. Uh, these dimensions have uh, 10 or 20 sub, uh, sub dimensions and questions. Um, but the second one uh, isn't, uh, uh, is the dimension that tries to understand uh, if we're looking at new challenges, at hazards that we, like at a certain frequency, trends that we're not, uh, um, didn't, that we didn't have before, uh, we need innovation. The, the responses of yesterday won't, uh, won't answer the problems of, uh, of the future. So there needs to be a certain sort of innovation potential. Um, and that's intrinsically probably in the, in the population that is affected. The second one, uh, the third one is uh, like some disasters and hazards, they will come. They will come anyway. We know that they will come. We just don't know like the time, uh, the time um, uh, dimensions and the trends. So will they come uh, once in the next year, uh, 10 years or once in the next 50 years? And everyone who has done risk assessments uh, uh, will know uh, at the end of the day, it's about building contingencies and uh, having contingency res uh, resources. And then like eight agencies come in, uh, particularly the poorest uh, 10, 20, 30% uh, of the world's population. They can't do by themselves. They, they need some sort of aid, uh, be it the public sector, be it the, the private sector, less likely because they can't probably pay, as we heard, like it's important uh, who pays for the risk management or the risk transfer, um, and then uh, the role of, uh, of age agencies uh, comes into play. Um, the fourth one is probably why we're here. That is infrastructure and, uh, and its ecosystems. To what extent, uh, particularly the poor and the extreme poor, they're directly uh, deriving ecosystems or the, their livelihoods are directly uh, dependent on ecosystem services. Uh, or on natural resources. Hence, the integrity and the health of these ecosystems are, are absolutely vital uh, to withstand uh, shocks. And the fifth one could also be called uh, institutions or governance. And having worked for uh, uh, the last three years for an uh, agency that's very concerned about power and governance like Oxfam, um, Technologies and knowledge and, and so on, that's all fine. But at the end of the day, it's about power. It's about how uh, uh, resources are governed and who holds the, uh, the power to use them and uh, to sell them, to buy them and, uh, and other institutional questions. Uh, just to tell you that I basically believe, and I always, uh, again, a challenge to uh, people that work on resilience, uh, we did have adaptive capacity since we had the first IPCC reports. Uh, and we, like resilience building is a lot about building adaptive capacity. And the, uh, the conceptual framework of resilience built on, the, uh, on frameworks around adaptation, uh, like this one, for instance, um, 
I still sometimes wonder what have we learned more through resilience? Just something to think about and maybe to research. Um, and then obviously uh, something that I, I talked about, uh, something that has been understood, uh, it's just uh, important of, to define what exactly needs to be done. It's the sustainable management of natural resources of land, water, forest, biodiversity, and you name the natural resource. Because uh, this will, that is one of these no regret solutions that lo lots of people talk about. Uh, investing in the environment, w like, I would, from a practitioner perspective, say builds automatically uh, resilience. Uh, something that I uh, um, think has improved in the last five years or ten years in terms of practice, what is being done out there in terms of building resilience, is it's, uh, it's uh, understood that only research, only policy influencing or changing policies, only project, lots of what agencies uh, have done, uh, would want to say, this project-based approach uh, is, uh, isn't doing the job by, uh, by itself. So it needs to be an integrated um, and a holistic uh, approach to build resilience, uh, looking at rapid onset and lo uh, gradual long-term changes in the, in the environment because um, you know, will know that better than I. Uh, there's a lot of sort of uh, uh, feedback loops and uh, mutual enhancing and uh, thresholds and, and so on. Um, just to walk you uh, through the dynamics of a, of a response uh, and maybe you, uh, we want to, uh, which like this depicts the drought cycle management. On the right hand side, uh, you see uh, the preparedness component or the preparedness uh, phase of what we call is a disaster cycle or a drought cycle. Um, this is about building contingency. This is about sort of drawing boreholes where they might be strategic uh, in, in view of an upcoming uh, drought peak. Uh, this is intervening in human and, uh, and animal health. If if uh, the body conditions of, of livestock, uh, if they're sort of, I mean, if you've been in Africa, you will have seen livestock that is almost falling over, being blown by a little uh, uh, wind. Um, if that's already the case before the drought hits, uh, obviously uh, those uh, will not survive. So there's a lot of preparatory work, a contingency type of, uh, and then uh, the left, uh, uh, right bottom, um, this is when, when the emergency stage, and this is when all the humanitarian agencies, uh, like Oxfam also has a humanitarian department, comes in, and the machinery of aid is basically, is absolutely vital to help these people to survive. It's just about surviving in the first days and in the first weeks. Um, and there is... Uh, uh, environmental uh, considerations, uh, I would want to say, are of secondary and tertiary uh, priority in that phase. But once the first weeks are over, uh, it is clear, and I think resilience building uh, has, has brought that to the forefront, it is important to invest already in the midterm and long term. Um, it it ju just can't be short term support, and then uh, aid agencies move out and leave uh, everything behind. And that again means in the long term, you need to sort of invest in, uh, in the environment, uh, natural resource management, sustainable land management, as well as uh, any um, economic uh, um, activities to improve uh, people's asset base, as we've seen in the five uh, blobs before. Uh, just to walk you through, through a couple of more uh, activities and types of interventions, uh, as we heard many times, the understanding of the context, and this is, I think, where science can help big time um, when it comes to monitoring systems and early warning systems. I've seen a couple of flood uh, risk maps, and we had uh, also in the first sessions of, of risks, uh, models, and, and maps. Um, in 98% of the cases where we work, that doesn't exist. And the data isn't there. And we can't go out and like work with the research institution or even uh, like use our own staff and collect the data over five years because the drought is there and we need to do something. Uh, so these, um, sorry. Uh, 
These uh, monitoring systems are absolutely vital also to strengthen the environmental component of it. And there are systems out there that practitioners uh, use, and I think that uh, for, for me as a practitioner, that is a very, very uh, strong interaction with, uh, with scientists that is absolutely translating into the improvement of, of action. Um, when it comes to, again to resilience and the, 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 uh, the thought behind resilience, and I've discussed that even in the break before, I think it's important, I mean, uh, that it's still about uh, sort of the intergenerational just, uh, justice, uh, like which resource can we use now, which assets uh, can we, uh, can we uh, or we're trading basically opportunities of the future of future generations. Uh, are we actually really building resilience of a subsystem or we just, uh, uh, we're just uh, having a transfer from another system, a flow of nutrients, money, energy. Uh, that it's, uh, for us, it's very important to make sure that there is no harm. There's actually, you might uh, even uh, cause some harm by, by doing something. And there again, I think uh, science is very important um, to give us more confidence uh, during the, to not do harm and to do the right thing. Um, is there two, three? Yeah, so, yeah a couple of minutes, yeah. Yeah, so uh, just to come back to that previous slide, um, this one, that it needs an integrated approach. Uh, po the policy level is as important uh, and that this should be uh, the decision-making spheres. That is why uh, NGOs have started, and particularly Oxfam and others, uh, work at the international level on influencing trade uh, schemes, uh, the international markets, in, uh, international negotiations uh, about climate or other things. Uh, they set the frame. Uh, so a lot of lack of resilience is derived from that level, actually. Um, you have to work with policymakers um, and tackle it at uh, country level as it is uh, the, the main legislative and policy making level. And I think that there's, an, there's a clear advancement from, from pure capacity building knowledge transfer uh, type of intervention that we had ten, until 10 years ago. Uh, as the last thing, I actually wanna uh, mention a project that I think is part of the African risk um, capacity or facility is called. Yeah, that's cool. uh, yeah, that is also with WFP, the World Food Program, and Munich Re or Swiss Re, I'm not quite sure, uh, that, um, that uh, tries to build resilience by uh, doing more than just risk reduction, but also uh, risk transfer, risk taking, risk reserves. Uh, that's what we call 4R. Four, four that is, uh, it is uh, about risk uh, diversification, and just to walk you uh, through the, uh, the, the, uh, the conceptual approach behind it, people that we deal with, uh, they're falling under this, uh, what people call the, uh, the food security uh, line or the uh, survival threshold, or they're called the livelihood threshold. Um, uh, and you'll see uh, people uh, often, they don't uh, stay food secure, th uh, food secure throughout the entire year, but they have like two, three, four months uh, where they're, they're food insecure, basically. Uh, seasonal shortages or lean seasons. Uh, and even in a good year, they just make it be, uh, beyond. Uh, if a drought hits, uh, that takes them one level below the, uh, the survival threshold. And they're like, uh, they're basically um, struggling to survive, and in the long run, uh, the the well-being or the uh, the livelihood situation will decline. And now the uh, the approach of the project is uh, yes, we do the what probably in, in, uh, among my colleagues what we do the usual thing, we do help uh, to use the, manage the resources better. That's what we did before, and that's uh, called uh, drought risk reduction. But then there's an insurance part, uh, and that actually comes from the African risk uh, facility. And people do uh, work for insurance. They are, they're so poor that they can't pay. Uh, so aid agencies come, come in, and that is the problem of these uh, risk insurances. Um, uh, we talk about very remote areas, like uh, farmers and rural population. Uh, uh, what aid agencies, what Oxfam then does, is all the, the marketing and the sales part of it. 
Because this is the reason why we don't have financial services in the very remote areas in Africa and Asia and, uh, and so on. Uh, there's a lot of costs involved. And you would want to say it's, I mean, it's aid or it's subsidized. Um, and then only insurance uh, alone uh, wouldn't help them to bounce back or to thrive. So uh, we added a component of credit and, uh, and saving so that in the long run, people can actually graduate and this is just the last slide that shows uh, we did have spillover effects. We, we did that uh, kind of approach in four countries. It started in Ethiopia. And uh, people from adjacent villages, they've actually seen that it does have a positive effect. And people have an interest to use their own money to pay for the premium, uh, even poor people. So that, that is a clear indicator. There must be a value. If poor people decide to use their very scarce resources for an insurance, uh, and you can see that actually has grown in terms of number uh, stronger than the people that are that are ready to uh, to work for the premium. That's basically uh, in short what I. Um, a last point I want to make: uh, agencies that are concerned with governance and power and they actually understand just knowledge, just technology transfer, doesn't do the job. It's about how decisions are being made in, in societies uh, and in communities. And therefore, uh, there's a lot of new approaches that are around uh, uh, flexible, forward-looking decision-making. The Red Cross has, uh, they call it gaming approach, which I don't like so much. But it's a new way of looking into the, into the future as a social process. And uh, things like transformative scenario planning, which actually comes from Shell uh, in the 80s, uh, comes from, from business and has been adopted in, in resilience thinking. Of, uh, it isn't, it isn't uh, always knowing, fully understanding the risk, but it's also, uh, there's a lot of irrational choices. Uh, as we have heard, like it's about perceptions uh, as well and uh, risk perceptions. Uh, it is also about the process of how decisions are being made at, uh, at various levels, and there's uh, many new approaches um, that I'm a big fan of. Um, yeah, I wouldn't want to. Well, there's uh, one last good message. While I'm, uh, you will have heard that I'm a bit critical towards resilience. However, I think uh, uh, is uh, it's a good. It's good news for you. There's certainly more environmental research needed to, uh, to back up resilience uh, building and to uh, fully uh, use the, the potential of ecosystems to buffer, uh, to buffer th these shocks and, and hazards. But there's also, from a practitioner point of view, uh, this interface is super important. We need to work together and uh, like we, we need to make that interface proactively work uh, so that thinking and doing is uh, goes in the same direction. Thank you very much. So I'm also talking a little bit about insurance and uh, specifically a project uh, called Oasis. And uh, I think it's a very relevant project to this audience because it really tries to connect the academic sector with the, with the commercial sector, specifically insurance. So um, really what we're trying to do is actually demonstrate the added value of, of research ultimately through, through this sector. So... I was going to talk about the interface between insurance and, uh, and, if you like, disaster relief, but I think a lot of that is, has actually been covered, so this is a little bit redundant, this slide. But I think you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a general understanding that risk is, is pervasive. The insurance industry has a very advanced understanding of, of, of risk. A different approach and uh, obviously a different business model to the disaster relief agencies, but there's increasing convergence where they share, and you've, we've heard that already, where they share information, approaches, they try to work together, and there's sort of a, really, a, I think, potential, very huge potential for sort of mutual benefit for both uh, actors, if you like. And um, so I'll leave, I'll leave that as is. So what is Oasis? That's the, the first thing I want to explain to you. What does it do? What is the benefit? What technical, economic, and scientific constraints 
did we have to overcome to in in this particular pro project, and what are the lessons in growing climate um, and weather research in this in this area? So first of all, what is Oasis? So David Simmons explained <coughs> um, the, the journey, if you like, the insurance industry went through of um, of basically estimating risk just on previous losses to all the way where, where they are now, very sophisticated modeling. <coughs> and uh, he mentioned a, one company in particular, RMS, who, who um, do a lot of this uh, modeling. But <coughs> there, there is a problem with this, with this approach, and that is that basically the incumbents are, are a relatively few handful of companies which basically supply the market um, to a view of risk. And the larger uh, players have their own in-house view of risk as well. So there is a, a perception in the market that not all is completely well, and they would really like multiple views of risk. And now, what, what does that mean? That means that they are fully aware that there is knowledge in the academic world all over the world for hazards, modeling, understanding, vulnerability. But that information flow is actually not going into the market. There is a barrier, and it's actually a technical barrier, an IT barrier, an institutional barrier, where that information flow isn't flowing as freely as it could. So Oasis actually is driven by the insurance sector to try and open up this flow. Now, one of the first things you need to do is you need to understand how, how does a catastrophe model work, and therefore you need to understand that the, the break point... So we can use this. Not really. What says back and next? So, the, okay. So, um, on the on the right is a is a little diagram. I'll just venture away. Uh, so, the the, S, the essential components to a catastrophe model are, are captured in this in this cartoon. And basically, in the commercial world, there is a basically a, I won't say it's a black box, but there's an end-to-end -end solution, and some people describe it as a black box, which captures all these components. So, in a way, this is what we just said. Okay, let's break this up completely into the components, recognizing that there are academic, smaller companies, bigger companies, expertise in every different component. And maybe we can build a piece of software, a piece of IT, basically, that allows people to plug and play the different components. So what are the components? The first thing would be the hazard model. So this is the probability of the hazard, the intensity of the hazard. Could be earthquake, could be flooding, could be wind. The next bit, which is the, in some ways the most fascinating one to me, is relatively new, is the vulnerability model. So this is basically the damage caused by a given peril. And that, the reason it's quite fascinating is actually that it's hugely uncertain. It's actually much, much more uncertain than the, the stuff I normally work with, which is the hazard, the probability of a hazard. So we're worried about 20, 50 percent uncertainties on some things, and the vulnerability can be orders of magnitude uncertainty. So for the same amount of flood depth, the damages can be hugely varying. So it's a big, big challenge to do that. You obviously need the damage data, and that often sits in insurance companies or with governments. People are quite protective about it. So there's a real, real problem with that data set. So the vulnerability. Then you put in your exposure. So if you're an insurer, you could put in your, the houses you insure. But if you're a country, you might put in lots and lots of different assets, um, your bridges, your infrastructure, your hospitals, all sorts of things in your exposure. And in, in this we have a very specific line, which is for insurance, the financial module. But actually, if you were using this model outside of insurance, it is very much designed for beyond insurance, any, any sort of risk assessment, really. So you would probably skip that bit and you have your own um, policy, and then ultimately you need to view display um, results. So basically, the idea is that you have a sort of uh, plug-and-play approach, where you can, I can pick a hazard model, maybe have multiple hurricane models of Miami, I have maybe my vulnerability module, and again, maybe I have multiple views of that. And I can plug and play and combine, through this calculation kernel, a new version of risk. That's the vision. That's, that's where you want to go, which then really opens up the, the entire market of, of risk, um, as long as people agree to use this piece of software for people to put in and, and use this particular framework. So it's all about the framework. The calculation kernel to do this will be open, will be free, so we're not trying to we're trying to open things up. We're trying to encourage people to play in this space. Um, so it allows hazard, vulnerability, and user interface specialists to easily offer their products. So rather than needing to know, well, I don't actually know what the vulnerability is, or I don't really know what, you know, what assets you have, 
it tries to tries to disaggregate too. Clearly, if you have everything in one go, then you you know you've you you've solved one particular problem. But we believe there's a huge opportunity in breaking it up. Um, we think it's, uh, it also provides much more transparency because it's very clear what the different components are. Um, and ultimately, it allows to users to be much more um, free in their choice of, of what, what view of risk they might want to take. And this is really, really important as, as the market gets more and more mature. People want to know about uncertainty. They want to know well, what, other, what other things could, could, could go wrong. So initially, people are quite happy with the first number. But then as they get more experience with it, you know, people increasingly ask for more and more information. So this tool um, and framework will allow us. And then ultimately, also Oasis is about creating a community of users of this, but also the providers. So what sort of thing you might produce as a producer, so if you're in the, in the research area, as an example of something we did, where the, the, the challenge was you have 30 years of maybe greater data in Malaysia, and the question was, well, what does a thousand-year event look like? Well, that's actually not a very easy uh, problem to solve. Um, so if you just had a point observation, you can sort of do a, a PDF and then work out the thousand-year return period. But actually, the insurance and a lot of people are interested in footprints. You know, what is the spatial scale of a thousand-year event? Not just what's the intensity value at a, at a given point. So we need to apply some new statistical tools. We created a, uh, we used the gridded data set of Malaysia and then statistically created um, these sort of what, what people call event sets. So these are characteristic event sets. So all the way from one-year events, which might happen on average every year, and then the sort of extreme rainfall events, you can see a thousand years on, the, on, the, on the, the top left. So this is out of sample. You've got 30 years of data, and we, we create statistical event sets. And if you've got 10,000 years of simulation, just statistical simulation, you can actually create ensembles of something which is really only observed once. And this on the left is the extreme event footprint, the fraction of the total land area of Malaysia, and you have the probability. So you have uh, for different thresholds of rainfall event, you can imagine that the footprint of, of that event changes um, with the threshold and also the probability, obviously. Um, but by taking 10,000 years, you can actually start doing what we call an ensemble. You can actually say, well, actually, maybe there isn't one answer here, maybe there are several. And sure enough, if you do 300 years of 30-year samples, and the solid line is your observed understanding of what the risk is, you can actually see there's a potentially huge uh, range of uncertainty there. So this is important information. So when you do the risk calculation, that you're not completely tied to one number, even what is a 100-year event. And then this sort of goes to, to trying to answer that a little bit more. Um, so the motivation for Oasis is that it's not for profit, it's open source, it's creating a community, um, and also the community needs to be diverse, it needs to be choice. We drive model transparency, so that's, we believe transparency gives you better decisions. Um, we think we can stimulate change by making it useful, and this is actually an IT challenge. We all know there's great research out there, there are nature papers, we know our academic careers depend on all sorts of metrics. Whether or not that actually translates into some, somebody in Lloyd's using that piece of information rather than just reading the paper thinking that's quite interesting is actually often a utility challenge. It's an IT challenge. Something has to be in his system at work where he can feed the relevant information in. And that is a huge, huge, huge problem. Writing the paper is, is one problem, which you know, most of you as PhD students will be concerned with, Actually, making a difference to somebody making a real decision is a really, really, really hard thing to do. And uh, we think Oasis is one solution to do that. Um, it's a phase development, and so there's constant interactions between uh, the members of Oasis and trying to make it fit for purpose. Um, ultimately, we think um, this has to be commercially viable, so there has to be a marketplace. Profit is good. Profit motivates people. Profit makes us sustainable. So this is, this is all about making products, if you like, which people are willing to pay for, and that makes it sustainable. So it doesn't depend on, on, on charity or um, government handouts or anything like that. So we believe that, that it needs to be uh, commercially viable. And ultimately, it's also about creating standards, because there are a multitude of different views of, 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 of perils and so forth, of, say, lots of cyclone models all over the world, but if they can all at least agree, if you like, the technical formatting of what output, what type of data they need to produce, 
then that really creates much more efficiency and then brings it to the market. So the reduced cost by, by creating standards is, is what we want to see. So who is in the Oasis is a huge list. So we started uh, three years ago with, with only a handful of, of, uh, of partners, which, which sort of are the, if you like, the founder members, which are on the left. And it's growing and growing and growing. And uh, now you see lots of small companies, giants like Swiss Re, Willis is in there. So we have a whole ecosystem of smaller insurers, reinsurers, brokers, all playing in that in this, in this space and all seeing the benefit for their own business. And they all pay into Oasis. Um, although it's not for profit, they pay into Oasis to, to keep developing that, that particular software. And then the other thing, of course, is the suppliers. So if you like, those are the users, and who are the suppliers? So the suppliers could be um, actual companies um, which, which produce risk. So there's ARA, ARA for example, is an example of, of a company. It could be academic institutions like Imperial or Reading. It could be um, also IT providers like IBM or hosting companies that can see that they, they can maybe run the software on their various platforms. There could be people interested in the interface. There could be people interested in all sorts of aspects of the value chain, of what, what different things that they're interested in. And there's lots of people recognize the value of this. So they are what we call associate uh, members. So they're not paying in, but they are observers and hopefully will be suppliers to make this whole thing viable. And that list is just growing endlessly because lots and lots of people are excited by it. Um, so what technical, economic, and scientific constraints we had to overcome... There was actually little knowledge in academic or business in cat modeling as itself. So there's obviously a lot of experience, including my own, you know, with some understanding of models, numerical models, and weather systems. That's actually not quite what was needed. You know, what was really, like I said, you know, it was a thousand year event. So that sort of challenges uh, our understanding a bit. So there's, there's a language issue and actually utility issue, you know. I, are you, you're training for one thing, but it isn't qu wasn't quite relevant, and I think we underestimated. Uh, the challenge there. Um, obviously, this is this is basically disruptive, right? So there are incumbents that don't want this to happen. Um, there are people that uh, you know oppose it uh, for for good reason, for their own for financial reasons. Um, so there was there was you know some pushback from people who are holding back, not wanting to share, and so forth. Um, so there's, there's, you're always going to have that if you do something. If you do anything useful, probably somebody's going to oppose it. Um, technical architecture. It's really an IT problem. It really, really is an IT problem. So you, we needed a very good team of programmers and people with really unique skills, both with industry, industry sector and in IT itself, as well as communicating with the users. IT is really, really, imp really important because it ha in the end, it has to be seamless and it has to, it has to work. And, uh, and then you just need to raise money. You can't get anything done in the world without uh, raising money. So we went around that. And so the Climate Kick and Innovate UK were, for example, the very first uh, sponsors of this. Um, and really it's been taken on by the insurance sector itself. So the motivation of open and open source is hugely, hugely valuable. You know, it gives you huge amounts of credit. There were previous attempts at this, and they all failed because people could identify there was a profit motive in, if you like, in the construction of the framework. People, people could see that they were going to be locked into some commercial framework. We're not trying to do this. This is going to be open source. We believe the framework should be free and so forth. So that's really important to get buy-in for people. So that, that's important. It's an important way to promote the idea and to get buy-in. Um, you need expertise in all of the core bits and pieces. Um, there needs to be understanding of what the standards are, so that's, uh, that's important. You need to take lots of small steps and, and get the users involved with that. So it's really, really uh, incremental. So you need lots of combinations, sector experience, mathematical, environmental research, IT, and business knowledge. So it's a, a large chunk. There was one press release which went completely viral, completely uh, caught us off guard. Because lots of people sort of recognize, well, that sort of makes sense. Uh, they could understand the motivation, they, they could understand the need. So there was huge international coverage. So when Oasis started, you know, it was, uh, you know, like I said, it was I know, 15 companies. And after that, Dickie Whittaker was the CEO. You know, his phone ran off, off the thing where everybody wanted to join, everybody wanted to understand. They could all see there was something in it for them, sometimes maybe incorrectly. But, uh, the, you know, if your motivation is sound, your, you, you know, your story is reasonable, it will... 
you know, people will eventually buy in. So I think it's, you know, it's a, in a way it was heartening to see that, you know, not, it wasn't just us who, who thought, well, this makes sense. It does actually make sense. And, you know, there is, there's good news when, when things make sense, things do happen. And so people talking about game changers and, and lots, of, lots of excitement. And this was uh, over a year ago now, so it's, it's only grown since. So that's um, an example of Oasis, and I hope uh, that many of you maybe will produce things that can go into Oasis, and if you want to talk to me about that, that would be great. So we've got some questions down this side, if you want to. Uh, maybe Richard there. Yeah. Richard Sibley, Reading. So uh, we've heard a number of talks about uh, big, complex models, and I w personally would never trust the output of a big, complex model unless it was extraordinarily well validated with data. And we haven't heard any talk about how the models are validated with data, so may maybe Ralph, but it would also apply to, to, to David. Thank you. Uh, who, who wants to ask the second question? Uh, uh, just over there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ollie Watts uh, from the RSPB again. Um, this is mostly for Martin, but actually it builds a little bit on the last question too. We heard a lot about resilience building, which is obviously a really important part of adaptation to climate change as well as other environmental change. Um, but to me, that is a bit about ossification somehow. And the big question in adaptation for climate change and other environmental change is how we adapt and move things on to a new future. In the biodiversity world, which is mine, uh, where I work, uh, we have two notions of, of, of developing. One is about building resilience against the threats that we see today and the impacts that we see today. And the other is about accommodating, how can we move to accommodate the, in, the, the impacts of long-term change? And we see those as slightly different things and they require slightly different approaches. And I'm wondering, Martin, particularly, whether you have any approaches towards developing that. Um, and you've mentioned that, it's a, that your project approach hasn't really worked. And I think the accommodation is more about a mindset um, approach. So how do we develop that mindset approach? And can we do that through the use of simple tools that are non-data, non-data um, hungry, but perhaps more qualitative? Thank you. Um, we had a question. There, yes. Thanks. Uh, sirs, uh, what do you think, based on what you've just presented each, uh, what do you think of a government uh, sponsored or controlled um, uh, procedure for young uh, adults, uh, those still at school, uh, how to deal uh, with emergencies? Uh, be they climatological, biological, or whatever. Um, in this way, uh, they would be imbibed with motivation uh, and to deal with catastrophes, uh, whatever the catastrophe would be in an emergency. Finished. Okay, thank you. So I think we'll, we'll answer those three first. So who wants to start on validating models? Okay, Ralph? Yeah, so, so validation is a huge issue. And it's completely data driven. So, in fact, the in the catastrophe model space, there are sort of there are, t if you like, there are probably two elements of the validation. One is the peril validation, which would just be, for example, you know, is your model reproducing, if you like, historical flood depths correctly or rainfall correctly, and so forth. So that's 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 more or less, if you like, mainstream for any. Um, atmosphere or any climate model, I think you know, for any climate model you'd, you'd want to validate at that level. The other validation, and actually this is more the insurance term of validation, is what maybe what we might call a hindcast, where they say, well, okay, you've got some statistical model, so you've got an expectation of a certain amount of loss. And then that's, that's actually the validation against actual damage. And that goes to what I was talking about, the vulnerability issue, that actually even if you have exactly the same meteorological event, you actually find that there's a range of damage, and that's, that's, that's the challenge, that you still need a model which can reproduce observed damages at a correct frequency. So it's completely empirical and completely data-driven. But I think it's the damage validation which is, which is really hard bit. And in fact, because it's so uncertain compared to the hazard, 
very often any sort of tuning that's done is done in what we call the damage function. This is a sort of amount of loss you might get for a given intensity because it's so uncertain. So validation is a huge and central part to, to, to all of this and the credibility of it. Yeah, um, I, I, could talk, I could talk a long time about I've actually wrote a paper on validation, which I'm happy to share. I mean, it's, 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 it's a massive process. I mean, in practice, every model is going to be flawed. There's, they're never going to position where you have a model which is perfect. And we never have enough data to validate the models. We're working in a non-stationary world. Um, if, if even just if forgetting about climate change, just think about exposure change. So we can look at what may have happened 60 years ago. 60 years ago in Florida, there's nothing but crocodiles. Right now, you've got lots of... Um, People coming down from New York, overwintering, massive property, theme parks, got loads of stuff that was never there before. So we can't really even look back in history without making loads and loads of assumptions about correcting the data. So it's a big issue. And in fact, I think some people, and I, I think data is important, but the thing we try to emphasize is the fact that you don't need to have perfect information and perfect data to get a valuable response. So, for example, the Caribbean cat scheme, when it launched, it, they didn't have, but they, there were models around. There's models from Equicat, from AIR, from RMS all around commercial models, all closed models, as you were saying, black boxes. But they were there and they were used. But they weren't covering governmental loss, which, which they wanted to do. So what the, what the people did instead was build a relatively simple index based on satellite data, or data from NOAA, rather, and USGS. Not perfect. But actually, that if there was an event, you can actually pretty well tell if there's an event that's likely to cause a loss, and you had some kind of simple mechanism which actually made sure it was guaranteed payment, then that was better than having nothing. And that, that mechanism was now paid out nine times, I believe. Not always perfect, but actually they've delivered money when you need it. The Africa risk capacity, which I'm working on at the moment, typically does use the same. You use satellite data, 10 kilometer grid squares, they've got 30 years worth of that data. So there's enough there to have a reasonably good idea about what's likely to cause a drought. Not perfect, but we can make sure there's money there. Then we can then spend our time trying to build better models. And the, the thing about building better models is not necessarily a result you get out at the end, that you do need somewhere to hang your hat. The most the important thing about having a better model is better understanding the process of, of risk. And that's really, really important. OK, thank you. Uh, maybe we we'll move on to the second question, which was how to adapt and move on in the face of uh, longer-term uh, changes. Maybe Martin could take that one. Well, I, I do see uh, some approaches. Obviously, like our our world is uh, ruled by short-terminism. Like I, I would think our economic and political systems are absolutely ruled by short-terminism. So, what's the incentive to take any long-term? And what are we like? Where are decisions being taken that have long-term implications, mostly related to infrastructure, I would think. Um, but um, the approaches that I'm seeing um, in also in the aid sector um, is multi-stakeholder approaches, looking at how decision-making is being done, things like transformative scenario planning. Uh, planning. And that, th that isn't the scenario that is built on models or quantitative uh, models. This is, uh, uh, those are, I think we even heard that term today, these are these narratives or stories where people agree, it's basically how do we uh, make decisions, how do we agree between different interests in societies or, or uh, decision makers in, in certain uh, systems. Um, and uh, there is a new paradigm in the management uh, world as well, which, uh, well, I'm not quite sure whether it's so new, but adaptive management, and I really hope it will make its way in the way how we manage projects, businesses, and uh, even our political systems. Thank you. Yeah, I think that relates very much to uh, Liz Robinson's talk in the, in the first session. Uh, so somebody like to uh, address the training for dealing with emergencies and... Well, all I can say is actually, I mean, it's, it's not really something that actually directly concerns us in the insurance industry, but anything which actually improves risk awareness within society, for me, is a good thing. Actually, there is, a, there is I think, just generally in society, we haven't got a great idea of the concept of risk. And, and also, the fact that risk isn't something you can eliminate to zero. You need to have risk in society, so actually society to, 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 to work. The issue is actually what's a, a safe level of risk and how much we're willing to pay for that. The example I always think of is actually John Prescott when we had a rail crash, so we will eliminate risk from the railways. Now you can <laughs> throw money at the railways, but does that make sense? Well, it probably take, makes more sense to try and improve risk on the roads. Right? So it's a matter of actually trying to understand people what appropriate behaviour is and what understanding risk actually would be beneficial, I think, generally. 
Okay, thank you. Well, maybe we'll take another couple of questions because obviously we're getting close to lunch. There's, there's uh, one question there and then one right at the back uh, top corner. Thank you very much. My name is Michael Stock. I'm working with the Walmart for London Mayor campaign. Just thinking about the Rockefeller work on resilient cities, I wonder if the panel would like to think about resilience and towns like London or Manchester or perhaps Bristol, what would be the question that you would want to be answered if you were running for mayor in any of those towns? <laughs> for example. Thank you. And then the question up the top corner. Um, hi. Uh, is this on? Can you hear me? It's a bit quiet. Maybe oh. you have to speak up. Yeah. Um, hi. Sorry. Tommy Gilchrist. Uh, uh, I work for Elizabeth Trust, but I'm a former graduate of Reading University. Um, David, you mentioned Florida, and I was quite interested in this because I had a paper published back in 2009 looking at the um, effects of an asteroid impact uh, on the Earth and the insurance industry's preparations for such mega catastrophes. And something that came up in my research was that the global insurance industry holds something like um, half a trillion dollars in reserve to cover all mega cats globally per annum. But Florida has $2 trillion of insured assets along its coastline. So what are the challenges for the insurance industry and for policymakers in making sure that we have um, the uh, preparations in place for such catastrophes as to become more frequent and more likely? Okay, okay thank you. Uh, I think we'll... We'll uh, take, take those two questions, because obviously we need to move on to the posters at, at lunchtime. So uh, who would like to address the resilient cities question? Uh, it's a tricky one. I mean, I, 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 honestly, I find the idea of trying to frame a question as being a very good question and a very hard one to answer. Um, it's, <laughs> but it, it's a very pertinent question. In fact, I'm, I'm actually, I'm glad you made me think about it. I'm meant to be talking in a conference in, in Singapore on this very issue but not Bristol, but actually thinking about uh, Jakarta and Manila and other cities, other cities in Asia. It's a, it's a difficult call. I think it's a, it's a, there's always a trade-off here between actually how much is the responsibility of a local government and how much responsibility of government and how much for the individual. And finding that balance is a tricky piece, I think, really, and actually trying to make sure you actually can check that making sure the government meets its obligations, because city governments typically, at least in this country, have limited budgets and limited scope to action. So for them, very often, it's a matter of making sure the things that other people need to do are done, I think. So making sure that we can get proper investment in resilience around, you know, if Bristol, I went to the university in Bristol, so I'm aware of it pretty well, but it, it, it's a Docklands area. How robust are we against flooding in a Docklands area? I think in 1740 something, the cathedral in Bristol fell down from an earthquake. So, you know, so actually, how resilient are we from earthquakes? So, I think it's a matter of asking the right questions, but and then actually being more a facilitator, I think, to make sure that things are put, put right. Okay, would you like to say something, Martin? Yeah, maybe I'd like to add uh, something that I have uh, always thought about uh, adaptation. Whose responsibility is adaptation? Is adaptation a public service? Are we looking towards government to uh, help us adapting or they adapt for us? Uh, or is it the private sector or everyone's uh, responsibility? I mean, it's a, it's a threat, but who, like, if we talk about responsibility, who, uh, where does it lie? Uh, and uh, I think we need to reopen the discussion about public goods and private goods uh, or uh, private and uh, public services, things like payment for ecosystem services we've heard today. Is that a public uh, in, uh, ecosystem service uh, or is it a private? Uh, um, I think that needs to be reopened when we actually really want to adapt. And this, know, this is a very good point. There's actually, again, without naming the country, I think it could be a bit embarrassing. There's one country where the, the World Bank tries to get a project going, which is trying to cover large industrial complexes against, against the risk of collapse from earthquake. Um, and in the end, that failed um, because there wasn't enough political will in that country to make sure that building standards, which effectively the whole idea was that insurance would reward decent building standards. So if you built something badly, you paid a lot for it. If you built something well, you probably were over-rewarded for it. But there wasn't enough political will to drive that through. And it comes back to the city's question as well. Actually, how much political will do you have to make unpopular decisions? <laughs> Okay, well that, that moves us on to the last question then, that, which was really a challenge for the insurance industry, so I guess this is one uh, directed to you, David, about uh, large losses. Uh, well, okay, there's two issues here. I mean, it does relate to kind of an earlier question as well. The insurance industry, I hate to say, like any business, is very short-term. 
right? Um, we're, we're, they're mostly concerned with actually surviving next year. The average CEO of an insurance company is there for five years. They tend not to think much beyond making sure they can retire with their bonuses intact. All right? they're, they're not massively, <laughs> this is I mean, a mere corporate thing, we're not really massively interested in, in the long term. So frankly, satellite impacts, on the, I mean, uh, asteroid impacts are probably outside the, the scale of most insurance companies worrying about it. They do worry, though, about hurricane in Florida. And they do worry, and they, they very carefully control and restrict their exposure. And they do rely quite heavily on models to actually try and make sure that exposure is in grounds which they can live with, and also which the Florida regulator is happy with. So the regulator here has a massive impact on behaviour in actually what Florida companies do and what they feel they can get away with. And there is group behaviour in this. There's a big psychological impact, I think, in actually how people react. They would tend to do very similar to what their competitors do. How can we build capacity? I think it is partly understanding of risk. And I think that the more we understand diversification, the better. As I said, we are at a good stage now for the reinsurance side because actually whereas Florida has been constrained in the past by not enough reinsurance capacity, now there is probably enough. Uh, in theory, um, to, for people who want to buy to levels they want to buy to. It's unlikely that all the Floridas will be wiped out in one event, but we've got a fairish idea of what, what would, well, maybe an asteroid actually, um, but other, otherwise probably not. All right? So we probably we understand the risk. It's better understand the risk, better understand the financial dynamics, and better using that capital we have, I think. Okay, thank you. So I think we should thank all the speakers for uh, answering the questions.